As I begin this morning, I invite you to imagine yourself into the scene of this morning's scripture. You've made the pilgrimage, right? You've, you've made the way, your way to Jerusalem with your family. The, the air is thick with dust and excitement as this city of 40,000 swells to over 200,000 for a couple of weeks as pilgrims from all over the known world come to celebrate the biggest, most central Jewish holiday of the year, Passover, which also just began last night for our Jewish sisters and brothers. And if you remember back to our uh, sermon series in the fall in the book of Exodus, you know that Passover commemorates that, that great story of liberation of the Israelites from the tyranny of Pharaoh and slavery in Egypt. That's what they are there to celebrate, what you are there to celebrate. So there you are with 200,000 of your closest friends camping out, barbecuing, celebrating your people's liberation from foreign oppression. But this is no 4th of July party, right? Because this celebration of liberation is taking place in the context of your current occupation, of continued oppression and exploitation now by Rome. Not Egypt, but by Rome. And therefore, this celebration represents not only a, a remembrance of the glories of the past, but but also inflames passions for that same reality in the present. And of course, Rome, like all empires, they were no dummies. They were well aware that Jerusalem during Passover, in this context, was a powder keg. And they were ready. As you and your fellow pilgrims fill the city, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, yes, the Pontius Pilate, who will come back into the story later in the week. Pilate parades in from one end on his war horse, followed by a whole column of imperial soldiers as a bold display of his military power and a reminder of who is in charge. As you make your way from one end of the city to the other, you can't help but notice the thousands of extra Roman soldiers who'd been called up to Jerusalem and, and stationed very visibly all around the city for intimidation and count, crowd control, effectively communicating to you and to the masses, don't you dare try anything funny. And you know what's going to happen to you if you do. It was this heavy-handed law and order approach that relied on inciting fear and, and subservience among the masses. And it was the very dynamics that you and all of your people long to be liberated from. As you make that journey across the city, you pass by the enormous Jewish temple, this complex, and you are swept up by the smells of barbecue and spices, the sounds of the marketplace of people selling and buying and getting all the things that they need and some trinkets and souvenirs, all the things that happen in a marketplace. And as you get to that other end of the city, you are swept up into, a, a, into crowds, waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, save us. And as you stretch your neck to see what all the chaos is about, you see this man that they are welcoming, coming in like a king, riding not on a majestic war horse, not like Pilate, but on a donkey, on a beast of burden? What in the world, you wonder? Who does this crazy guy think he is? We've got Pilate riding in on a war horse, his majestic stallion, and you're coming in on a donkey? What gives? And then you realize the ancient words of the prophet Zechariah, how he spoke of God's anointed one, of a king like David who would liberate the people from bondage and oppression, how he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. This man's street theater, his entrance, you realize, is in fact, a counter-protest to Pilate's entrance. 
a counter display to Rome's imperial power with true power, a display of what God's power looks like. Not a violent conquering hero, but a humble servant. But as Jesus' next move makes clear, this power is anything but passive. While it's nonviolent, it refuses to draw a sword. It is direct and it is active and it confronts the powers that be head on. Who is this? You ask someone in the crowd. It's, it's Jesus. It's the prophet from Nazareth, she replies. You've heard this name before, but you don't really know much about him, so you follow him as he rides on past the crowd toward the temple, wondering what, what he's going to do next. As he gets to the temple and he gets off his donkey, he turns and, and for a moment, your eyes meet. Uh-oh, you think. Like the great prophets of the past who came to Jerusalem with a, a mission to raise their voices against injustice and corrupt religious and political leaders, you can sense that this prophet's dramatic entrance was only the beginning. And after Jesus pauses for a moment, he moves swiftly toward that outer court of the bustling temple complex, and he begins acting like either a madman or a prophet or both, driving out those who were buying and selling and flipping over tables, the tables of the money changers. And then in the chaos, he proclaims those words of the great prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, through whom God said, my sanctuary is to be called the house of prayer for all people, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. And then something unprecedented, truly unprecedented happened. Those who were blind and lame suddenly streamed to Jesus and he healed them. Right there in the temple, those who were explicitly barred from the temple, from God's sanctuary because they were unclean, because as we've been exploring for the past six weeks, Going back to King David, their disability, their illness was interpreted as God's rejection of them. And so they needed to stay away from the rest of us clean and holy people. Indeed, those people who were thought to be inferior and whose exclusion was considered divinely sanctioned by scripture and theology, they are the ones who see Jesus' actions in the temple as good news who hear this new king's proclamation from Isaiah and Jeremiah as reversing the order of society that since King David had justified their marginalization. Jesus' actions there in the temple were inaugurating a new era, the reign of God's kingdom in place of the kingdom of Rome. Now, to be clear, this wasn't about creating a theocracy. It was about a reversal of values, a reversal of structures and relationships and cultural attitudes and practices. As in all those other stories of healing that we've been exploring in this season, when, when those in charge of maintaining the current order, in this story, the, the local religious leaders who were also in charge of the Jerusalem temple and had collaborated with Pilate and Rome to maintain the status quo. When they see what Jesus is doing, threatening their power, they grow violently angry. So there you are watching this stunned, frozen, remembering <laughs> Pilate and his soldiers all over the city thinking to yourself, oh, this is not going to end well. And indeed, as you will soon find out, those leaders will begin plotting for a way to have Jesus killed, crucified, 
a well-established way that Rome used to put down any threat to its peaceful law and order. So the questions for us this morning as we enter Holy Week, knowing where Jesus' actions will lead him, the consequences, we, we ask why. Why does Jesus do this? The, the soldiers, the, the passions being aroused by a celebration of liberation, the masses easily given to mob mentality, whether with cries of Hosanna today or cries of crucify him tomorrow. Jesus had to know that his actions in the temple that day were asking for a heavy-handed response. So why, as a prophet, what, what point was he trying to make? What was he trying to accomplish? On the one hand, these aren't easy or simple questions to answer. And yet, if we have hearts to perceive, Jesus makes it quite clear you see, in the Old Testament, the purpose of the temple of, of God's sanctuary is for it to be a place that fosters a culture of grace and generosity and gratitude and hospitality to the stranger, on the one hand, and on the other hand, that, that distributes justice for all in the community, especially for those who are marginalized and vulnerable. But over time as we know can happen, that mission, this purpose, seems to go by the wayside. As empires like Rome occupied peoples like the Jews, they collaborated with those local power brokers to maintain their, their law and order, their rule. Because, the, because of the centrality of the temple in Jewish life, Rome collaborated with its religious leaders, offering them immense power and wealth, if they would work with Rome to implement its oppressive system of taxation, which relied heavily on exploiting the poor masses while enriching a few. And in fact, their efforts, those religious and political leaders' efforts to work with Rome, well, it allowed them to be given vast estates in the countryside surrounding Jerusalem that were then farmed by peasants an arrangement that kept those families indebted across generations. You see, the temple leadership not only controlled the local economy and taxation, but also, as we've been exploring, established those social norms through both laws that determined who was clean, who was acceptable in God's eyes, and who was not. And then they created religious attitudes, justification for that exclusion, to perpetuate these prejudice laws. Once again, as we've been exploring the past six weeks, this, the list of those in power, uh, those excluded by those in power, those marginalized, the blind, the lame, those with all kinds of illnesses and disease, women who are bleeding, this is the exact same list of people to whom Jesus goes with whom he eats, and to whom he brings healing. See, by the time of Jesus' ministry, the religious elite and the political elite, they're basically one and the same thing. And among the poor masses, the temple had become a symbol whose majesty was matched only by its brutality, its injustice. It may have been awe-inspiring and beautiful a place where heaven met earth. But according to Jesus, it was no longer the place where God's healing and renewal were restoring a broken world to wholeness. And by associating his actions in the temple on that first Palm Sunday with these particular words from the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, Jesus is choosing this action, this message as one of his final lessons, is that which he will give his life to proclaim. 
The prophet Jeremiah had also prophesied God's judgment of the temple and its leadership in his day because they too were exploiting the poor and stealing from the people. But even more, both Jesus and Jeremiah, they're protesting, protesting a two-faced religion where people can participate in injustice and then presume to hide behind their religion in order to maintain their privilege and this, this sense that they are good people. Or to put it in the context of American history, Jesus and Jeremiah are, are protesting against a world in which clergy can preach about God uh, to good Christian folks who then leave the doors of their sanctuary to attend a barbecue at the site of a lynched black body and see no dissonance between the two, as was the case not on a rare occasion, but quite often in this country. You see, in the words of a professor of social psychology, what they are saying is that it is possible to get an A plus in a course on ethics or, or a gold star in Sunday school. It's, it's possible to know all the right answers and still flunk life. Jesus and Jeremiah are protesting against a false religion in their day. And indeed, in every generation. But as always, this word of judgment is prophetic because it is also bound up in a word of hope and healing. In contrast to that dominant embrace of, of false religion in his day, which perpetuated brokenness, Jeremiah proclaims, if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the immigrant or the orphan or the widow, if you don't shed innocent blood in this place, and if you don't go after false idols to your own harm, then I will dwell among you in this place. In other words, when the temple, when, when the church, when communities fail to live into our God-given mission, when, when that which is meant to embody hope for a future of flourishing, when, when that becomes an obstacle to flourishing, the implication is that God chooses to no longer dwell among them but that God will go somewhere else and raise up people who will do what God has called. As with Jeremiah, so too with Jesus. After, after his bold protests against the status quo, Jesus shows us the way of true religion, true power, one that doesn't cozy up to those in power and privilege, but stands in solidarity with the powerless. A religion that doesn't exclude and marginalize the vulnerable, but, but rather that embraces the vulnerable with a love powerful enough to heal and restore us to one another. And a love that does this, knowing like Jesus, like Jeremiah, that there may well be a cost to doing so. Friends, as we enter Holy Week, the question for us is, will we count the cost? Will we consider it our duty and indeed our joy to take up our cross and to follow Jesus so that God's sanctuary, God's community, may truly be a place of welcome and refuge and healing for all. May we indeed be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world for our healing, for the healing of all creation. You shine.